Hello and welcome again to UCL Global Health. The Indian public health physician Abhi Bang used to say every child counts, so count every child. And knowing the size of a problem is halfway to solving it. Uh, we get ourselves tied in knots in global health about estimating the global burden of disease and which estimates fit, fit which. But the central problem remains, how do we measure births, deaths, and, and the causes of death? Um, I'm joined by Ed Fottrell, who's uh, a senior research fellow in epidemiology at UCL. Um, most of the world doesn't have the kind of registration systems that we have. Is that right? And, that's and how do we measure? Yeah, that's right. So probably about between two-thirds to three-quarters of the world's population just isn't counted. And um, not surprisingly, perhaps most of those people are in the world's poorest countries where the need to count and the need to measure and know the causes of ill health and the burden of ill health is greatest so that you can use the information to plan services. So mm. how do we start? How do we do it? And actually, we have to start from the first principles, really, of epidemiology. We need to know who is dying. We need to identify the actual deaths and the yeah. deaths, um, the when, the where, but then also the why. We need to know what are the causes of deaths in, uh, in people. And this is a challenge, of course, because many people will go through their lives without being registered, without ever maybe even seeing a doctor. Mm -hmm. So there may be no records at all of firstly their existence, but certainly no records of their health and their illness. So the challenge then is well, how can we count them and then how can we assign a cause? Okay, so counting, uh, we do surveys, we have research surveys, we have national surveys and internationally funded surveys, the, the demographic and health mm -hmm. surveys, and we get some estimates. But then we have the problem of causation. You know, somebody's died, we want to know why they died. Um, what are the methods that we have for doing that? Okay, so first of all, you're right, those are the types of methods that are used to count people. And they tend up to now really to have been surveys, you know, one-off things or like the DHS yeah. perhaps every five years. And I think there is a bit of a push now to try and... Um, you know, what we want to achieve is complete vital event registration for everybody around the world so that we know the causes of death. We're not quite, we're not there yet, we're still a long way to go. So we are relying on surveys. And you're right, once we've identified the deaths, that's not the end of the story. We need to identify the causes. So we use a process known as verbal autopsy, um, which is a method whereby, uh, again, through a kind of survey process, an interview process, a field worker goes to the family of a deceased person mm. and asks them about the symptoms, the circumstances um, of that their deceased loved one experienced before death. And using that information... So, that, hang on, that needs to be done quite sensitively. Oh, that, yes. Yeah, so it's a very... I mean, you're dealing with a very sensitive issue. Mm. People, they were talking to... So these are specially trained people. They're, they're trained yeah. um, field workers. It has in the past been done by medical professionals, but there's been a trend recently, or over the last few decades, actually, away from that, to, to lay trained interviewers who are less likely to guide the interview down a certain path. Do people want to talk about this, or do generally, or uh, do some people shy away from... Response rates for this type of survey are amazingly high. I'm yeah. always surprised at how, you know, people are open and they want to talk about it. They're, they're curious themselves to, to find an answer often to what the cause yeah. of death was for their loved one. So you get the story, and then what happens? You give it to some doctors to look at? That was the traditional approach, and that's probably been the most used approach over time, that this information, so the signs and the symptoms and the story, is given to doctors who you kind of, in some ways, will mimic a sort of clinical process. They'll try and interpret that and come up with a probable cause of death. That's going to take two years, because doctors are <laughs> incredibly busy. So it's, it's expensive, is the first thing. I mean, yeah. doctors have a high yes. salary. <laughs> yes. um, Let's not go into that. Anyway. Yeah. It's... Um, and t very time consuming. It can be years after the actual interview before you end yeah. up with you know, cause of death information. And another issue with that is there's an issue of reliability, that if you give the same information to 10 doctors, you may well get 10 different diagnoses. <laughs> um, or if no. you give it to the same doctor a year apart, you might get two different diagnoses. Right. So there's an issue there of, of reliability in the sense that if you want to measure trends over time or between places, you can never really be sure that the differences you're seeing are real differences in causes of death or differences or, because of the method. So, right. so what's the answer? What's the new kid on the block? Well, the, the, the trend now, and there's been a big shift and a lot of research in the last 10 years, um, focusing on computer coding of verbal autopsy. So right. using statistical methods, Bayesian probabilistic reasoning, um, to interpret or to look at the signs and symptoms that are reported in a verbal autopsy interview. So standardised questionnaires. Standardised questionnaires. Then you feed it into a computer and it spits back a 
a, a list of probabilities? Yes, so um, there, are, there are various <coughs> methods, but the, the method that we've mostly been working with, which is the interva method, uses a probabilistic approach. So you give it the information that's been collected using a standardised questionnaire, and then statistical reasoning goes on, the magic happens, yeah. and then it tells you for each cause of death a probability or a likelihood of that cause. Okay. And how reliable, I mean, do you ever have the ability to compare verbal autopsy against real autopsy? And, and as a gold standard yeah. and kind of see whether, how accurate they are. I mean, that, that's the, the holy <laughs> grail in a way, to be yeah. able to, to validate any kind of verbal autopsy method. Okay. And the challenge is, and is finding that gold standard. And there's a general kind of feeling now and a consensus that there is no gold standard for cause of death because, okay. you know, a pathological examination, a real autopsy, is doing something quite different and is trying to achieve something quite different. Yeah. Verbal autopsy is a... Is and may not be accurate itself. Of course, may not be accurate itself, that's right. So, okay, we've got a system. What's new? That, I mean, has the smartphone, for example, changed the parameters? Are we able now to do something there and then when Absolutely. we're out in remote countries? Absolutely. So, I mean, the, the, the shift towards computer coding in verbal autopsies, um, obviously now, you know, you're taking out this long delay, you're taking out the variability. I mean, if you give the computer the same right. sign of symptoms, it will always come up with the same causes of death. Right. Um, but it's, it's done by a computer. And as we're getting more and more sophisticated tele mobile phones, handheld devices, tablet computers, we can now build direct data capture of the verbal autopsy. So have the verbal autopsy questionnaire right. on a phone, for example, and then use that phone for the data capture. But also within that same device, process the data, interpret the data, and generate the likely cause of death there and then at the same point in time. And be able to feed it back to the families? Potentially. So this, I mean, this is all cutting edge, and actually within um, UCL Global Health, we're working with the computing department to develop this app. And um, we've done some pilot testing in South Africa, and we're doing some more in Malawi very soon, where we, we know that the respondents want to know. The respondents of these mm. interviews want to know the cause of death, and they want to be told. Um, but there's a number of issues we need to think about first. The ethics of this. Um, I mean, we're, we're blurring the boundaries here between health measurement and health intervention, if you like, yeah. or health promotion. There's obviously a lot of potential for using the information about a cause of death within a household mm. to give information to that household, perhaps, on how they might be able to um, prevent illness um, themselves. But who should do that? I mean, if, as I mentioned earlier, it's generally lay field workers, trained field workers, but not medically professional, um, medically qualified individuals who are doing the interviews, are they really the ones to give this information? Yeah. And what's the process that um, it should be done? And also what kind of support networks then are necessary for survey teams or health measurement teams to have some sort of um, follow-up for families where they've been given right. some information, which could right. be quite traumatic and sensitive. I mean, it could be that the family don't have a had no idea that their loved one died yeah. of HIV, for example. So it's got to be linked to some kind of counselling process Absolutely. as well. This is quite a sensitive yeah. so, area. So but it sounds to me like this is a technological revolution for epidemiology. And hopefully it would mean that our global burden of disease estimates will really tighten up. Yeah, absolutely. So I think putting the kind of direct feedback to the respondent to one side, the very fact of being able to have real-time data capture, data processing, is very exciting. And there's a big push by global health authorities to move away from verbal autopsy just as a research, kind of sporadic, every now and again survey approach, and actually do it on a routine basis. Right. So count every death, follow it up with a verbal autopsy, probably on this type of handheld device with real-time data processing. The data can then be sent wirelessly, SMS, to a database somewhere where, where you have real measurements now of um, deaths and the causes of death. And that will take away the need for these um, large-scale kind of modelled estimates of, for example, the global, global burden of disease, which cause a lot of controversy and um, are not easily understood or interpreted at many levels, but particularly by those who most need health information, for example, a district health manager. A global burden of disease estimate is not particularly useful, perhaps, to right. someone who needs to know right. what is the problem in my community. Okay. This type of approach of direct, real measurement is going to be much more useful. So every person counts. Count every person. Ed, thank you very much. Thank you very much.